subject title is differential operators on curves and uh, uh, in algebraic groups. Uh, <coughs> so first of all, thank you very much for coming. I notice that it's a second talk today, uh, so I'll try to be gentle. Uh, and uh, well, if you have questions, please interrupt me and um, just shake me up. Okay, so. <coughs> Uh, well, I, I will begin with, so here is a plan of the talk, uh, I will begin with some motivation, in fact the title which, is, which was originally announced, uh, I consider it as a motivation, so I, 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 I try to focus on some recent results, but I will try to give a very brief survey uh, of this question the question of differential isomorphism and differential equivalence. Uh, as I understand, this is a differential algebra uh, seminar, so uh, well, the word differential is in the title, but uh, I won't be using any differential Galois theory or anything, which doesn't mean that there is no relation, there is probably, but uh, I will be talking about differential operators on algebraic varieties. And this is what differential refers to. <coughs> okay, so, <coughs> all right. <coughs> okay, so let me start with definition. Um, so if we have a commutative algebra, uh, any commutative algebra over a field uh, defined over a field K, so later I will assume that K is actually algebraically closed of characteristic zero, in fact, complex numbers, uh, one can define this uh, nice object, a non-commutative algebra called the ring of differential operators on A in the following way. Uh, so this definition goes back to Grothendieck, uh, which I don't know if it's really uh, correct, but uh, at least um, uh, that's uh, the reference. Uh, so <coughs> the ring of differential operators is defined as follows. Uh, we consider all linear endomorphism of this commutative algebra A, and then we define filtration by subspaces dr, which are differential operators of order at most r, and these subspaces are defined in an iterative fashion so <coughs> D0 is declared to be just A itself, <coughs> more precisely just multiplication operators by A, and then once D0 is fixed, we define DR by considering all linear endomorphisms such that the commutator with any element of uh, A with D0 gets into R minus one. So the idea how to define differential operators, the defining property, is the fact that commuting with a differential operator of order zero decreases uh, order by, by one. Uh, so this definition may look strange. You probably can imagine some other definitions, but uh, the main observation is that this definition actually behaves, so this construction behaves nicely uh, geometrically. For example, <coughs> one can Using this construction, you can shifify differential operators, and you can define shift of differential operators on an arbitrary quasi-projective variety. But I will, in my talk, I will restrict to a finely reducible varieties. Uh, and in this case, the corresponding commutative algebra is just the ring of regular functions. And by dx, I will denote this non-commutative algebra this construction applied to the regular function. So differential operators, by the very definition, are defined as operators on functions. But, of course, the definition also involves this kind of canonical filtration, and I, and uh, in what follows, we will actually consider dx as abstract algebra, and I will, this means that I will forget this filtration. So the questions which I'm going to discuss of course, become completely trivial if we consider dA as a filtered algebra. So I define this algebra by using this differential filtration, but then I sort of commit a little crime and forget about this filtration. <coughs> um, 
Okay, so, uh, right. Uh, well, so if x is non-singular, then dx, the structure of dx is very well known, and it has very nice properties. So in particular, the following holds, if x is smooth, dx is a simple, meaning no two-sided ideals, material domain, domain meaning no zero divisors, generated by finitely many elements in degree one, so you can actually describe in this case dx geometrically. You can simply say that uh, dx is generated by uh, functions, multiplication operators by functions and vector fields. Uh, moreover, it has very simple sort of nice uh, homological structure. It has finite global dimension, which is equal to the dimension of x. Uh, so this is well known. I don't even know who actually root it first, uh, but if x is singular, and I will assume, well, I will not assume that x is smooth, otherwise the story will be not interesting, uh, I will actually assume that x is singular, then it is again known that dx is very sensitive to singularities of x, and perhaps the most famous example, which was discovered in 1972 by Bernstein, Gelfand, Gelfand is the following. If you consider a cubic cone, which is a, just a surface given by this equation in C3, then in this case, dx actually is as bad as you can imagine. It is not simple, it is not material. In fact, it has an infinite chain of two-sided ideals. It is far from being regular, so its homological dimension is infinite. And it has so it very wild dream. And I should say, even at this point, despite much effort, uh, questions like on which varieties dx has nice properties, for example, Naterian or simple, are quite complicated in higher dimensions. And as far as I know, there is no really some general characterization. Despite the fact there are some interesting facts and results, which I will mention, uh, but uh, so the question how does dx depends on singularities of x is quite subtle. Uh, and, but if we restrict to curves, then it turns out that dx is still relatively nice and this is the first, this is a result of Smith and Stafford who proved that if x is any a fine curve, and I always assume a reducible, singular or not, then dx is always Noetherian and ring and finitely generated as a k-algebra. Uh, but of course, it is not necessarily simple, and it is not, unlike in Smooth case, and it is not um, regular. It may have global dimension two or infinity. So uh, but still, ring theoretically, it's still Noetherian ring and uh, finitely generated. Uh, so it makes sense to make the following definition. Uh, and this is kind of main motivation for the rest of the talk. So let's, of course, this definition makes sense for arbitrary varieties, but I will restrict to curves. Um, well, <coughs> there are interesting examples in higher dimensions, but Maybe I'll postpone it until the end. So if x and y two curves, we will say that <coughs> uh, x and y are d equivalent if the corresponding categories of d modules are equivalent. And we say that x and y are d isomorphic if the corresponding algebras, if the algebras of differential operators are isomorphic as abstract algebras, not filtered algebras. And this is the notation I'm going to use. Uh, so one thing you should note is that uh, d equivalence is a very natural property. Uh, if you know a little bit of non-commutative algebra, this is a crucial kind of distinction between commutative or non-commutative algebras, that the categories of modules over non-commutative algebras may be isomorphic, may be equivalent, even if the algebras are not really isomorphic which is impossible in commutative case. So when we pass uh, from Ox to Dx, it is natural to introduce two kind of notions of equivalence. One is 
this differential equivalence and the other is differential isomorphism. Of course, by the very definition, it is obvious that we have implications if curves are isomorphic, they're certainly differentially isomorphic and they're certainly differentially equivalent. Uh, right, so, <coughs> uh, so a simple observation, uh, actually, I don't know very simple direct proof of this fact uh, due to George Wilson and uh, myself. I, I, I should say that uh, we have actually a survey paper going back to 2004, which is called Differential Isomorphism and Equivalence of Varieties, which kind of summarizes what is known about this problem and various connections. Uh, so <coughs> I will give references at the end. Uh, so it turns out that if both curves are actually smooth, then uh, differential equivalence implies isomorphism. So we have these three notions uh, equivalent. Uh, uh, as I said, it is natural to conjecture that this actually holds for any smooth varieties, not necessarily curves, but as I said, uh, even this fact is not known. Uh, uh, so I, <coughs> I'm still given some results as kind of black boxes, but in the later part of the talk, I, uh, later I will uh, try to open those boxes and see how really uh, some of these results are uh, proved. Um, okay, so, uh, well, one can also ask when, if you take two arbitrary curves, when they're actually differentially equivalent. So if x and y are both singular, then there seems to be, for example, more precisely, have multiple singular points, like double points. Uh, there seems to be no, well, at least, um, well, there are some partial results, but there is no any general characterization, or at least simple characterization of the equivalence. However, if one of these curves is smooth and the other is not necessarily smooth, there is a remarkable uh, observation due to Smith again and Stafford saying the following, that uh, if x is smooth, then y is differentially equivalent to x. Oh, uh, sorry, this is a mistake. So this is supposed to be equivalence, not isomorphism. Uh, bad mistake, because, uh, sorry. <laughs> so this is supposed to be differentially equivalent. So y is differentially equivalent to x, if and only if uh, the normalization of y is isomorphic to x, and the normalization map is set theoretically by jet, or which is the same thing in jet. So this actually characterizes D class, a dif differential equivalence class of a smooth curve. So informally or <coughs> geometrically, you may think of such curves, singular curves Y, as been obtained from X by producing um, maybe arbitrarily bad cusps. So of course, this condition, the second part, prohibits any singular points apart from just cuspidal singularity. So, it's, it's something surprising because from the sort of classical commutative algebraic geometry point of view, cusps are considered as very bad singularities, but from the point of view of differential operators, it looks like these cuspidal singularities are actually good. In, in, in the sense that the category of D modules on such a singular curve actually behaves exactly as a category of D modules on smooth curve. Um, Actually, um, uh, maybe I make a side remark. Um, yeah, do you have any questions? So you're saying if you take a curve only with cusps, yes, then it's differentially equivalent to its normalization. Yes. So you take a curve, a reducible curve with cuspidal singularities, take its normalization, which is the same thing as resolution of singularities. And then, uh, uh, but cusps can be arbitrarily bad. So you can take, for example, one cusp of higher order, or you can take many cusp of order one, and uh, <coughs> it's still the same differential equivalence class. Uh, 
so I know many people probably here are interested in differential equations. And actually, I sort of came to this kind of problem from a completely different direction, in fact, from a problem in analytic theory of partial differential equations related to something which is called Huygens principle. This is some very nice property of classical wave equations in even dimensions, starting from four, starting from our dimension. And there is a very old problem still in general unsolved, which, which is, has many names. One of the names is the problem of lacunas or uh, the Mars problem. Uh, it asks, the problem is to characterize all equations, not necessarily with constant coefficients, which have this, which satisfy Huygens principle. So the point is that there are some examples very, very, very special, and it's still not known where they come from. Uh, and sort of philosophy, I mean, the relation to this kind of problems is the following, that this kind of differential apparatus with very distinct, very nice analytic properties are actually global differential operators on some singular algebraic varieties which are differentially equivalent to, to a smooth variety, or more precisely, to even a fine space. So uh, there are many, well, this is kind of, I, 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 later I will give you some examples of such, of such things. But uh, um, it seems like this the problem of describing precisely this D equivalence class for, so I, I described it for curves, but it would be very nice to have a similar theorem for varieties of any dimension. Uh, there are some results in this di direction, but it, they're not so complete. Um, okay, so, <coughs> uh, so what about differential isomorphism? Uh, this is even more curious. Uh, okay, so uh, the first result, in fact, it's a chain, a sequence of several papers uh, by Gail Letstra, Leonid Makarlimanov, uh, I should have mentioned also Perkins, Smith, and stuff, but there is a chain of papers which eventually converge to the theorem, which says the following, that if we take two curves, x and y, uh, then, uh, and <clears throat> let's assume that none of these curves satisfy this condition. Oh, sorry, no, uh, at least one of these cures, at least one of these cures, x or y, satisfies this condition, let's say x. So this condition says that normalization is just a fine line and normalization map is injected. Then uh, isomorphism and differential isomorphisms are equivalent <laughs> notions. So two cures, uh, isomor differentially isomorphic if and only if they are isomorphic. So this kind of effectively I will explain later where this kind of comes from, how, how do you kind of show this, uh, prove this. Uh, but this actually restricts the problem of differential isomorphism to all, for all curves, just to curves in this specific class. And notice if you compare this theorem to the previous <coughs> one, you can say that this class of curves are exactly those curves which are differentially equivalent to A1. Sorry, this is supposed to be must be B. <laughs> so this is a fine line. So, uh, right. Uh, and now, of course, the question is, well, what happens for two curves in this class? And the answer is rather surprising. Uh, it was first discovered by, uh, in a thesis of uh, some French young mathematician, uh, Kouakou, but he didn't really publish his thesis, and we rediscovered this classification with George Wilson four years later, uh, but by a completely uh, different method. So I will explain some sort of more advanced way of thinking of these things. Uh, so Kaku just managed to prove this result by brute force, and uh, I, I, I still, I, I, still hard to even, but anyway, I mean, he discovered this fact first, and uh, so the fact is the following, that if 
to each curve in this class. So if you take a fine line and take any cuspidal curve which, is, uh, which has normalization of fine line and normalization map is injective, so in other words, you just take a topologically a sort of simply uh, connected curve and, but with arbitrarily bad cusps. Uh, then it turns out to each such curve you can assign a unique non-negative integer, which we call differential genius, such that two curves are differentially isomorphic if, this two, if the corresponding numbers are the same. So in other words, within this class of curves, curves are classified up to differential isomorphism by a unique integer, by a non-negative integer. Uh, so this integer appears in many different ways. Uh, and, uh, but none is actually very simple. Um, um, so, so the, the proof of this result actually uh, involves quite a few things, uh, conceptual proof, and I will explain. But the, my, uh, so, so my uh, goal in this talk will be to discuss actually the atomorphism groups of, this, uh, of such curves. Uh, and I will try to explain how we extract this invariant N from the group of atomorphism of this algebra dx. Yes. 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 What kind of integers are realizable here? Are every integer Zero, can be one, two, three. Every, every. All the, oh, sorry, right, of course. Yes, every, every integer. Every integer. Every integer. Uh, uh, so I, I gave some kind of, as I said, this is a black box. I will, I will get back to this. So I will show you exactly what are representatives of this class. But let me change now subject a little bit, or actually completely, and start with something which, uh, which is very important uh, object in algebraic geometry, in fine algebraic geometry, the Cremona group. Uh, uh, so, so I will get back to this problem, but sort of in a rather roundabout uh, way. Um, <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> I will, I remind you that uh, the fine Cremona group or it's called sometimes integral Cremona group. It's just a group of all polynomial automorphisms of the complex plane. And I, for just, it's not very essential, but uh, for the purpose of this talk, I will restrict to so-called unimodular or symplectic automorphisms. And these are just automorphisms of C2, which preserve the natural symplectic form. Um, and this group was studied by many people, uh, and uh, the first important result goes back to 1942, and, uh, uh, and it was rediscovered in the sequence of three papers, actually many more, many more papers by Shafarevich, uh, that the group, so first of all, uh, this gives actually natural gener generators for this group. So the group, uh, this unimodular <coughs> polynomial automorphisms of C2 is generated by automorphism of this form, uh, where Px and Qy are arbitrary polynomials. It generated in what sense? Generated as an abstract group, right? Um, well, it is obvious that these are, of course, polynomial automorphism. What is not obvious is that every polynomial automorphism can be written as a compositional automorphism of this form. Right? But, of course, much more is known. So let me... Uh, yeah. How do we get this like, arbitrary linear combinations? What? How do we get arbitrary linear combinations from this? Arbitrary linear combination is here. From the previous slide, uh, I didn't get it. Uh, How does this give? You, you can compose different. No, well, you can so compose. One and then one and the other. Yeah, yeah one and the other. Okay, nice. Uh, actually, well, I will show you formulas. Okay, later. Later. Uh, but, but, of course, uh, more natural way is actually the following. So this group is actually amalgamated product of two 
uh, subgroups, sometimes called elementary, I denote them A and B. So A is just a group of symplectic affine transformations. Uh, so I assume that this determinant equals one to preserve symplectic form. And this group B is a subgroup of so-called triangular or de jean transformations, which have the following form. And U is just intersection of A and B. So as a discrete group, this atomorphism uh, unimodular automorphisms are just free amalgamated product of two relatively nice subgroups over the intersection. So uh, this is actually the result, of course, uh, actually Shafarevich stated it in this form, but uh, Jung uh, essentially proved this, but uh, uh, he didn't use this algebraic terminology. Well, there are many more proofs. In fact, in the literature, there are at least seven different proofs uh, for complete cremona, for, for, for um, not necessarily symplectic atomorphism, but, but these are completely clear. So I want to move in a slightly different direction. I want to ask a question, what should be a quantum analog of this group? Well, quantum analog, uh, quantum in quotation sign, um, so let me make it more precise. So first of all, we can simply think of this atomorphism group as just the group of uh, atomorphism of polynomial algebra in two variables, preserving the canonical, the natural uh, Poisson bracket. Uh, so in this way, you can think of this atomorphism group as the group of Poisson atomorphisms of this Poisson algebra. Then of course, if you then this question about what is quantum analog becomes clear, so we just replace polynomials by the Weyl algebra, uh, which is quantum quantization of this Poisson algebra in any natural uh, sense of the word. And then the question is, what is actually this atomorphous group of A1? Uh, so the answer to this question, again, is known, and it was one of the famous theorem of Dixinger about the Weyl algebra. So he proved actually that exactly the same atomorphisms, uh, phi p and psi q, which generate that group, also generate the atomorphism group of the Weyl algebra. Of course, in this case, x and y no longer commute. They commute, they satisfy the canonical commutation relation. Nevertheless, uh, Generators and relations are actually the same, so as abstract groups, these two groups are isomorphic. Uh, actually, uh, well, so this is, an, uh, let, let me uh, say a bit more precisely how this isomorphism really uh, can be constructed. Um, and this is, uh, again, quite well-known result due to Makar Limanov. So we introduce a third group, which is a group of atomorphism of free algebra on two variables x and y, satisfying this relation where bracket is just the usual commutator. So we take all atomorphism of free algebra of rank two, satisfying this condition. So this is sort of non-commutative for some atomorphisms. Then there are canonical projections onto the Weyl algebra and onto the polynomials in two variables. And what Makar Limanov showed that these two projections induce isomorphisms like this. So in reality, there are three groups, namely this commutative, quantum, and non-commutative, which is abstract groups are isomorphic. And as a result, we can say that atomorphism group of the Weyl algebra and the atomorphous group of the free algebra preserving the commutator uh, also can be written as free amalgamated product. Yes. Uh, is it true that uh, this result also says that uh, I can list any automorphism of A0 and A1 to this larger associated algebra? Or it's not like that? Well, that's what it says, abstractly. So the atomorphism is the same. Ah, so at the moment, ah, okay, okay. Well, I mean, you see, no, the reason you may ask why did I restrict, to not, why don't I consider all automorphism, but restrict to automorphism of this form, it's just because otherwise this isomorphism 
won't be true, right? Because in Y algebra, we have a relation commutator equals one, but, but the, the, the entire group of automorphism of free algebra is also not very far from this. So if you, if, you, if you forget about this condition, then you can show, and this is, again, another famous result due to uh, nice lady, I, uh, Anastasia, with a long Polish name. Uh, um, so, uh, yeah, so the result is that if you take two, any two automorphisms of a free algebra on two generators, then uh, this condition will hold up to scalar, uh, up to scalar factor. So uh, for, any two, for, any, for any automorphism sigma, this relation holds up to, multipli multi up to multiplication by non-zero scalar. Um, so I just fix that scalar to be one. So it's essentially uh, the same group. Um, okay, so I stress once again that all these facts, all this isomorphism hold only abstractly, that is as just abstract groups. Uh, so, <coughs> um, right, so later on each of these groups, one can, on each of these groups there is a natural algebraic structure, in the algebraic structure. On this group, this is really goes back to the work of Shafarevich. Uh, on these two groups, in our paper with George Wilson, uh, which I will explain later, we actually mimic Shafarevich construction and introduced in the algebraic structure. What is remarkable <laughs> is the fact that this isomorphism, abstract isomorphism, are not isomorphisms of algebraic groups. So, in fact, we can think of this abstract discrete group on which there are three natural, at least three natural, in the algebraic structures. So these isomorphisms uh, do not respect algebraic structures. So, <coughs> um, okay. Um, now I will try to um, move back to the problem I started with. Um, so, <coughs> right, so I mentioned already this word quantization. So one way of thinking is the following. So, uh, of course, modules of a polynomial ring are nothing but quasi-coherent shifts are equivalent to the category of quasi-coherent shifts on a fine plane. And uh, quantization means that we actually uh, deform in the category, not just an algebra. And after quantization, uh, what happens is that uh, the same category may be represented by two different uh, non-commutative algebras. So simplest example is, of course, matrices. If you take uh, just n by n matrices over, over field or over any ring, they're all uh, equivalent, Marita equivalent, they, or they have the same uh, module categories, but the corresponding automorphism groups are different. So this is, so the uh, way how I'm going to look at this problem of uh, finding different uh, automorphism of this algebras dx, uh, I will look at it by analogy with this example. So we take the while algebra, which is the ring of differential operators on a fine line, and then consider all these curves which are, which are in the same Marita class of the Weyl algebra, but the automorphism group will be different. So in many ways, <laughs> these automorphism groups, uh, which we will consider of these algebras dn, corresponding to this different fixed differential genus, they behave very much as these classical algebraic groups, and I will stretch this analogy. So <coughs> uh, let me... <coughs> Remind one fact, which is a known theorem, well-known theorem from uh, non-commutative algebra. But uh, um, so, if you take two algebras which have equivalent module categories, well, so as I said, they are not necessarily isomorphic. But the following is true: this is really called Marita theory theorem that one of these algebras is isomorphic to the endomorphism ring of some finitely generated projective module over the algebra, over the other algebra, 
and one condition is missing, this module also has to be a generator in the category of right module. So uh, A prime is isomorphic to endomorphism green of finitely generated projective generator in the category of A modules. This is exactly what happens in case of matrices. Matrices are just endomorphisms of K or Cn over, over C. So this is, of course, the simplest example. Uh, now, the question when actually such endomorphism rings are isomorphic is again has an abstract answer, namely two endomorphism rings are isomorphic if and only if uh, the corresponding progenerators are on the same orbit of the non commutative Picard group, which is just a group of all outer equivalences of the category of modules. So this is abstract theorem from non commutative algebra, but I will show in a moment how it actually becomes geometric. Um, right, so now I'm coming back to the question which I started with. Uh, so which algebra Samarita equivalent to A1? Uh, well, if you look at A1 as a Reno differential operators on a fine line, then we already know the answer. This will be exactly differential operators. Um, sorry, I should say that if you look at non-commutative domains, that is algebras without zero divisors, which are Marita equivalent to A1, these are exactly uh, rings of differential operators on those singular curves satisfying condition star. So uh, curves which are rational cuspidal curves with normalization C1. So here is one example of such curve. I should have probably given it earlier, but uh, there are many more. So <clears throat> the problem which, again, I mentioned already uh, is to describe uh, the structure of the atomorphism group of such algebra. And this, is, this looks like a hard problem to, well, classify these groups up to isomorphism. Uh, and this actually amounts to extracting this differential genius from atomorphism of DS. Um, OK. Uh, right. Maybe it's a good uh, place to stop. Uh, uh, right. Uh, so the question, okay, so I want to actually now uh, explain how, um, what is behind the proof of this, uh, of this, of this theorem. Um, um, right. Um, okay, so maybe I should start with a general problem, which is, uh, as far as I know, hopeless. If you start with uh, any curve, well, of course, you could start with any variety, but if you start with any curve, and a natural question is to just classify commuting differential operators on the curve. So, of course, uh, there is another well-known fact, uh, which is probably well-known in differential algebra as well, that if you take uh, any operator on a curve, differential operator, it's normalizer, uh, sorry, it's uh, centralizer, all differential operators which commute with it, I actually form a commutative algebra. So two differential operators which commute with the third one commute between themselves. That's a uh, mesmerizing fact for many people, but uh, but this actually reduces the question of describing commuting differential operators to just describing maximal commutative algebras. Uh, and of course, a natural thing would be to describe such subalgebras up to the action of the atomorphism group. Uh, this seems like a hopeless question, uh, but recently some very interesting examples were constructed, uh, which which are not related to my talk, at least directly, or at least I don't know how. Uh, so Mirona actually found an answer to a question due to, well, going back to Dixie the following, that if you take uh, a commutative subalgebra in Dx, so suppose x is a, um, a fine line, uh, then you can ask what are possible so 
the read of differ uh, commutative differential operators form a commutative algebra, which is actually the algebra of uh, functions on a curve. So the question is, what kind of curves arise? So for example, can you produce a maximum commutative subalgebra in the while algebra such that spec uh, of that commutative algebra would be a curve of higher genius? The answer, surprisingly, is yes. So he constructed example of a genius. Diximir himself constructed example for g equals 1 for elliptic curves. And uh, with the help of computers, now I think they constructed such examples for any genius, right? It's, uh, it's a very curious operator. I have a question about that. Yes. So the, uh, but the ring of differential operators of that algebra is not going to be contained in there. So can you, can you identify very nice question. Special yes. subalgebra is those which, where you have all of the derivations of the. So you're asking the question to pose a, take a curve x, take yeah. dx, yeah. take a commutative algebra, and look on differential operators on that commutative algebra. What is the relation to dx? That's exactly next slide. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but let me be precise. This is a, yeah, this is a very good question, and it has a very good answer, purely algebraic, with no algebraic proof, at least, uh, uh, yeah. So, okay, so, uh, as I said, if I just take arbitrary commutative subalgebra, I don't know, uh, very little is known. So what I will do, I will consider very special commutative, I see. Okay, so it starts complaining. Okay. Uh, right. So what I will do, I will consider commutative subalgebras, which we call MAD, uh, which satisfies the following property. So this MAD means it's a maximal abelian not new potent subalgebra. So I will <coughs> remember that the ring of differential operators on X contains algebra of functions O X, and O X acts on dx, well, first of all, it's a maximal commutative subalgebra, and it also acts on dx ad potently. If you take sufficiently many commutators, you kill any differential operators. So I will restrict to commutative subalgebras which have this property. And uh, I will try to classify these ones. So this, in some sense, new potent subalgebras. Uh, of course, example is OX, and it's what we call trivial example. So the result which was now proven by Macaulay, Marlow, and Perkins, and which is related to the theorem I mentioned earlier, is the following. So dx contains non-trivial mat subalgebras, non-trivial, which means different from this one, if and only if x satisfies star. Now, if you think a little bit, this theorem immediately implies the theorem I mentioned earlier, because what I said earlier is that if you have two curves, x and y, and at least one of them doesn't satisfy this condition star, then the differential isomorphism implies isomorphism. So if you have a differential isomorphism, you can take in one ring in dx the corresponding ox and look at its image under that differential isomorphism. And of course, the, 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 the image must be a commutative ad potent subalgebra. And if the other curve doesn't have any other subalgebras except for OY, then you are forced to have isomorphism between OX and OY, therefore differential isomorphism implies equivalence. So this class of curve star can be characterized in a different way by this property. So DX contains non-trivial mad subalgebras. Uh, now, uh, <coughs> Okay, so uh, answering your question. Uh, uh, so let's take this curve X, uh, which satisfy Y. Uh, then uh, it contains some met subalgebra, let's say A, or take any met subalgebra, consider the corresponding curve, uh, the corresponding curve, which is spec A. Then Y, Again, satisfy star, but the ring of differential operators on Y is not actually isomorphic to differential operators on X in general, 
But the claim is that they exist on X rank one portion free sheaf L, such that if I twist dx by that L, then we do have this isomorphism. So that's the answer. So the answer is that, yes, so if you take any math subalgebra, the ring of differential operators, and it is isomorphic to dx up to twisting by torsion free sheaf. But of course, uh, for different sheaves, dlx is not really uh, the same as dx. Uh, so the question is, OK, we want to actually correct. So this answers the question of for a single set of subalgebra. Now we want to look at this set of all subalgebras, math subalgebra. <coughs> then it turns out that there is actually a natural bijection. So the set of all mad subalgebras of dx can be identified with this quotient, where g is the group which I mentioned earlier of atomorphism of the Y algebra or atomorphism of free algebra on two generators, and this is a triangular atomorphism. So uh, this set actually has a um, nice description, but as I said earlier, it's natural to consider actually another, so it's consider, to consider this maths of algebras up to the action of atomorphism group of dx. So this will take a different, another quotient, and this double quotient, it turns out, has a very interesting structure. So I will uh, turn to this in a moment. But I should say that this kind of facts, uh, despite purely algebraic statements, they don't have really uh, purely algebraic proofs, at least we don't know. So the proofs are based on translation of this problem to the question about algebraic solution of so-called Hadam uh, Petriashvili nonlinear PDE, which is one of the basic integrable systems. Uh, and it turns out, so the relation, I will not go deep into this, but the relation is the following that those curves satisfying condition star turns out to be exactly spectral curves of so-called rational or sort of simplest algebraic solution of KP hierarchy. So uh, I can explain this. Uh, well, so we actually, so all the proofs we, we, we know actually make heavy use of this, uh, um, of this connection. So basically, all the statements are translation of certain statements about solutions of KP Hayek, which, are, which were, some were known, some were not. But uh, this is a huge industry. There are many people actually studying solutions of uh, these integrable hierarchies. And uh, basically, you can, <laughs> in kind of strange fashion, prove algebraic facts using uh, differential equations. Um, so in our survey paper, this is explained in detail. But um, I want to get uh, So that's the equation for uh, rational solutions in non-zero. Well, well, I mean, the, 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 so, so, you, so the question is, what is rational solution, right? Um, uh, I don't know if you have had any experience with uh, integrable systems. So there are many uh, kind of, uh, okay, so one question is, uh, so precise statement is the following. So you look at this nonlinear PDE, which is just first member of some infinite sequence or infinite system of partial non-linear non partial differential equations which are compatible in the sense that they have a common solution. Uh, so rational solution means that you're looking for solution of this equation which, which are rational as functions of x and decay when, uh, at infinity when x goes to infinity. So this are pr precisely rational solution which uh, decay at infinity. Then it turns out that those rational solutions in X have a very specific form. Um, uh, in fact, they can be written in this fashion. Uh, I will write some function for I, Y, and T, and I runs from 1 to N. Um, so they, uh, sorry, it should be square here. 
So any such solution, rational solution, can be written in this form, where this phi i is a function depending on y and t. And what people observed, and this is kind of a remarkable connection, that this poles of this solution, depending on i, n is some fixed number. In fact, it can be any number. So this solutions actually, <laughs> solu uh, actually are flows of some finite dimensional Hamiltonian system, which is called Kalodjeromoza system. And this is very general phenomena in integrable systems. When you look at some kind of algebraic solutions and ask question, what is the dynamics of poles or zeros, then you usually discover some finite dimensional integrable systems. So there is some very deep duality between uh, algebraic solutions of infinite dimensional sort of integrable systems and um, Hamiltonian, classical Hamiltonian integrable systems in classical mechanics. So in this case, so uh, I explained it kind of informally, but this can be stated in purely geometric fashion, this relation. And this is what we call Kalodjeromoza correspondence. Um, right. Uh, <coughs> Yes. 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 So, uh, is it correct that G and B don't depend on X? Very good question. Yes, it is correct. So for every X, yes. groups are okay. Yes. Okay, I see. Yes. But once I take quotient by the automorphism group of DX, then I will have to take quotient by G by this automorphism group, and that quotient turns out to have a very nice structure of smooth algebraic variety. So just. I will come back to this again. You will see this formula in a second. But I will first introduce those varieties, and uh, which are kind of very interesting on their own, and very simple. So I define them in a very plain way. Uh, so these are so-called Kalodjeromoza spaces. Um, okay, so what are these spaces? Well, I consider pairs of matrices, x and y, satisfying this condition. Uh, so notice this one. Uh, if I put zero here, of course, what I get will be empty. There are no commuting matrices. Uh, there are no matrices, which, well, plus minus doesn't matter. I could put minus here. So there are no matrices x and y whose commutator is equal to identity matrix. Okay? That's a simple exercise for first year linear algebra. The answer is take trace. If you take trace, trace of commutator equals 0, trace of 1 equals n, so n has to be equal to 0. But if you kind of consider the closest possible sort of situation, then you require that the difference between commutator and identity is 1. And you look at all such matrices. So you can think of such matrices as a kind of, in a sense, approximation to the canonical commutation relation. Right? Um, then it turns out that this is a nice algebraic variety. Ah, uh, yeah, so I consider, of course, I identify those matrices uh, which are the same, in the same conjugacy class, so GLN acts on such pairs by simultaneous conjugation. Scalar matrices act trivially. It turns out that the induced action of PGLN on such pairs is actually free, and so I can take quotient and the quotient is a smooth, a fine variety of dimension 2n. So there is a nice paper by George Wilson uh, about the spaces, uh, which paper in Mencionas with a lot of interesting properties. But the, the most interesting property is the fact that these spaces are actually reducible, the spaces are connected. So it's a smooth, a fine, uh, reducible variety of dimension 2n. Uh, another property which I won't use, but uh, is the following, that these spaces, in some sense, are very close to the Hilbert scheme of points on C2. So Hilbert N on C2, this is another very remarkable space. So roughly speaking, points in this space are a collection of N points on C2 with multiplicity count. Or if you want to be more precise, so you consider all ideals in polynomials into variables of co-dimension n, which is uh, zero-dimensional subschemes of co-bands n. 
and this is what is a Hilbert scheme. So it turns out that this space has a real manifold actually diffeomorphic to Hilbert n, but the complex structures on Hilbert scheme and Cn are different. Uh, so in particular, of course, they have the same topology, uh, but um, complex structures are different, and this, for example, Cn, as I said, a fine variety, but Hilt n is not even, uh, it's uh, quasi-projective, so, it, so it's not even a fine. Right? <coughs> so, uh, so what Nakajima actually knows is that they are members of the same uh, hyper family of manifolds. So really, the reason Cn, you can think of it as a real manifold, there is a uh, sphere, CP1, of complex structures, and one of them corresponds to Hilbert's, one point corresponds to Hilbert's scheme, and the rest are isomorphic and correspond to Carvajal and spaces. <coughs> so, <coughs> okay, so this is uh, a nice uh, variety. It will uh, play a role. Now, how is this? Already, this kind of relation suggests that there must be some relation to the Weyl algebra, and the relation is the following. Um, so, first of all, um, the group G, I remind you, this group G was the group of automorphisms of free algebra on two generators. Um, I should remind you. So, this will automorphism which preserves <coughs> the data. So this group naturally acts on this Kolodz Ramosa spaces. Just maybe I should be more pedantic and I'll put sigma inverse. So I'm thinking of these matrices X and Y as a kind of coordinates, fat coordinates of a point. For n equals one is just C2, and this is just numbers. And so sigma acts on such points the same way how it acts on points on the usual plane. So it should have put sigma inverse, sigma inverse. But of course, for the theorem, it doesn't matter. So this action is uh, transitive. Um, now, think, again, it's sort of interesting to compare this fact to Hill n. So if you take the Hilbert scheme of n points on C2, the group, the Cremona, fine Cremona group acts on it. Of course, the action is algebraic, but it is very far from being transit. As I said, Hilb M, the points in Hilb M are just collection of N points on C2 with multiplicities counted. So you can take one point of multiplicity N or N points of multiplicity 1, and there is no way that the automorphism of C2 transforms one to another. So in sort of classical world on Hilb M, the action of the automorphism group of the Cremona group is non-transitive, but on this basis, this group G actually acts transitively. Uh, and <coughs> this is kind of was main result. Uh, if we take this Weyl algebra A1 and look at all ideals, right or left, of this algebra, I restrict to right ideals. Then I want to consider the space of isomorphism classes of ideals. So I identify ideals if they are isomorphic as modules. Then it turns out that there is a natural G equivalent bijection between the joint union of these spaces and the space of ideal classes. Again, in the classical commutative case, this is uh, well known, but I don't know where it's written. I mean, if you, if you ask a commutative algebraist, he may be. So take, take, take a commutative algebraist and ask him a question. Give him polynomial ring in two variables and ask how to classify all ideals. Oh, not, not necessarily a finite codimension. The answer is that the space of all ideals, of course, ideals are identified if they are isomorphic as modules. <coughs> Uh, actually, just this, and it's very easy to see. The reason is that if you take an ideal of a polynomial in, a, in polynomial ring in two variables, in its isomorphism class, there is a unique ideal of finite co-dimension, and this defines a map in this direction. Right. In the other direction, you define as follows: if you have an ideal of finite co-dimension, 
you take a quotient by that ideal and take an isolate of the cyclic vector which corresponds to one. And this gives you the ideal plot. <laughs> this gives you a, the same ideal in representative in here. Right? So, so there is this kind of almost obvious bijection, uh, but in case of while algebra, this is highly non-obvious fact, and the reason is that while algebra has no finite dimensional representations. So you cannot expect that there are sort of ideals of finite for dimension. There are no ideals of finite for dimension, so it's not even clear what this number n is. But for the moment, I, uh, this is, um, so, well, you may ask, well, can you actually, if you give me a pair of matrices, uh, so what, what the theorem saying informally? It tells me that if the ideals in A1 are classified by pairs of matrices X and Y, satisfying this nice rank one condition. Right? So if you give me any pair X, Y satisfying this relation, such that commutator plus one rank one, I can, right, I can give you ideal in A1, and the claim is that all, the up to isomorphism, all ideals arise in, in this way. So in fact, uh, there is a nice formula for this map, which is given by, by this. Uh, so I take characteristic polynomial of X, take characteristic polynomial of Y, and twist one of them. Um, I should explain this notation. So when you have this relation, this relation means that commutator plus one has rank one, so there is a vector and covector such that this thing is equal vector times covector, let's call it i and j, and then you can hook up the following explicit element in the fraction field of the Weyl algebra, and this is actually a fractional ideal of A1, which represents uh, every isomorphism class. Mm -hmm. So if you want a canonical representative, you should look at fractional ideals, uh, uh, finitely generated submodules in the quotient field. But it's a nice formula. Again, for expert in integrable systems, this is a remarkable formula for so-called data rahiesa function. Of course, that's how um, it was uh, well, discovered, uh, but, <coughs> right. Um, okay, so now we can, um, uh, right, so now I can get back and try to explain how conceptually uh, you prove this theorem about classifying differential operators up to, dif uh, classifying curves up to differential isomorphisms. So as I said, if we take this curve X satisfying condition star, then the corresponding algebra DX is Marita equivalent to uh, uh, A1. And therefore, we can write DX as an endomorphism ring of some ideal. So actually, those <laughs> curves X uh, satisfying condition star exactly such curves on which differential operators are endomorphism rings of some ideals in the Weyl algebra. Of course, if you take Weyl algebra itself as an ideal, right ideal, it's endomorphism ring A1, and this is differential operators on, curve, on a fine line. But for arbitrary ideal, it turns out that we get exactly different endomorphism rings are exactly those differential operators on those singular curves. And now the question to answer the question when dx such d is isomorphic boils down to the question how to identify endomorphism rings of two ideals. And I can remind you now the theorem which I stated uh, here as an abstract theorem from non commutative algebra. If we have two endomorphism rings of an algebra A where P is finitely generated projective module, then they are isomorphic if and only if one of these modules is in the orbit of the Picard group of the other module. Okay. Now you can see what happens in this case. Uh, all such finitely generated projective modules 
of rank one, which are exactly ideals, or isomorphic to ideals, are classified by this uh, spaces Cn, and there is a covariant bijection. So here there is a natural action of peak of A1. Here there is a natural action of this G. And it turns out that peak of A1 is isomorphic to, to G. So, and we know that G acts on Cn transitively. So Cn are exactly the orbits of peak A1 under this identification. So the number N, which I was referring to in that theorem, is exactly this Calogero Mose index. Um, uh, in fact, you can, using this, uh, you can actually construct representatives for those curves. So if I take number n, then I can consider a sort of simple cusp and zero of order n, like this. And the theorem says that, well, for any, d, any dx is isomorphic to dxn for some unique n. And moreover, dxn and dxm are not isomorphic. So for n equals 0, of course, this is just the y algebra. So up to isomorphism, we have exactly this countable 0, 1, 2, 3 uh, sequence of non isomorphic, non pairwise isomorphic. Uh, on commutative algebras, each of which is Marita equivalent to D0 to A1. Um, so once you get this result, of course, a natural question is to understand what is this. So the amorphous group of A1, this is this famous Dixie group. And the question is, what, what are the amorphous groups of these DNs? Uh, one difference is that you can't expect to describe this DM in a kind of uh, elementary fashion using generators and relations uh, for n greater than 1. Uh, <coughs> um, uh, OK, so, so as I said, for dn equals 0, we have this amalgamated free product decomposition. Uh, so a natural question, does it exist for any n? And the second question, which is much harder, is that whether this is true. So these are kind of big uh, discrete groups and we want to construct invariants. We want to show that uh, n is determined by the amorphous group of dn. Um, so, uh, so that was a preliminary and uh, so this question was open for quite a while. Uh, Open means uh, no even ideas how to approach it. Uh, and actually, we found a kind of very interesting way to solve it. Uh, so maybe I should ask, how much time do I have? Uh, you're probably tired. Uh, I'm go going to become more technical now. Um, OK, so. Okay, so roughly what I'm going to do is the following. Well, so first, there is a nice description, well, more complicated, but still nice kind of description of these groups uh, in terms of amalgamated products. Uh, I will have to remind you some machinery how to do this. So these are two kind of independent problems, but to solve problem B, you really need to have a solution to problem A. Uh, but problem B is a kind of very interesting. Uh, so we have this big discrete group and we want to construct this invariant. Um, so short answer, the approach is the following. We will put on this group an int algebraic structure, making it int algebraic group. Then we'll look at the so-called well, Borel subgroups and classify Borel subgroups. Then we show that Borel subgroups can be characterized by purely group theoretic terms, sort of just as abstract groups. And then we will show that this conjugacy classes of Borel subgroups in here and here determine number n. So that's kind of a, a, a kind of approach. Um, but the key to the, the first observation, which, which was missing in some sense, 
now I don't know why, because it's not very hard, but uh, it's actually geometric realization of these groups. Um, so this is a theorem which, which is the beginning of... Um, so, <coughs> so let me again... Uh, so what is, a, so what, is, what is the strategy? So I look at this nice algebraic variety, and the, as I explained, there is a transitive action of this uh, group G on Cn, and so it is natural to ask about the isotropy groups. And the observation is the following, that if I choose base point appropriately, in fact, it doesn't matter, the action is transitive, but if I choose base point, so this will be my specific choice, you can easily see that if I take commutator of these two matrices plus one, it will have rank one, and look at the stabilizer of this point under the action of uh, the group G, then it turns out that uh, the automorphism groups of the algebras Dn, which, um, which, which are this, so differential operators on curves like this, are exactly uh, uh, the stabilizers of uh, this, this point. Of course, if I change a point, I change uh, Gn by uh, automorphism. So, 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 so basically, the claim is that what dn can be viewed as a stabilizer of this natural action of the group G on this finite dimensional algebraic varieties. So the, the strategy will be to study really the action of G on this algebraic varieties and try to say something about uh, stabilizers. <coughs> so in particular, each, so this isomorphism allows to identify each Gn as a subgroup of G. Right? <coughs> Well, so I explain here how this identification really goes. So what is the key fact? Um, so let me... Uh, so first of all, uh, the automorphism of Dn sits naturally in the Picard group. So I remind you, the Picard group is just a group of outer equivalences of the category of Dn module. So if you have an automorphism by twisting the action, you get outer equivalence. Now, by Marita equivalence, Dn is Marita equivalent to A1, so Marita equivalence gives me isomorphism of this outer equivalence groups. And here A1, and here there is a similar natural map. And there is a remarkable observation by Stafford that for the wild algebra itself, the natural map is actually isomorphic. So for any Dn, it's just embedded, and here it's isomorphic. Right? So now I... Uh, combining these arrows, I can view this Dn as sitting inside of what A1. So we have these uh, arrows, and the claim of the theorem is that the image of Gn, so this is just an embedding corresponding to isot is isotropy subgroup. This is this makarli manov isomorphism I mentioned earlier, which is induced by the projection, and this is Im given by this diagram. And the claim is that the arrows have the same image, and this gives an identification <coughs> of the addition uh, Dn. Um, <coughs> so it's a little bit uh, non-direct, but uh, this is very useful fact. Um, right, so any questions? Um, so, as I said, I want to address these two problems. Uh, maybe I, uh, just to give you some relief, uh, so this is a little technical. Maybe I'll skip part A. The proof of part B relies on part A, but uh, the statements are kind of independent. So let me uh, skip maybe this machine, this bus there. Um, it's a little technical, but get back to, to this uh, Borel uh, subgroups. Um, um, yeah, so I, I, again, I'm not, I will not explain how this is proved, but the whole structure seems quite uh, amazing. I, I, I should say that recently, there were quite a few papers appeared uh, 
uh, trying to generalize this to higher dimensions, um, which, which actually doesn't work. Uh, it seems like it's very uh, one dimension. Um, so. Okay, so, <coughs> so uh, right. So this group of automorphism of uh, free algebra on two generators has a natural indalgebraic structure. So um, in the sense of Shafarevich. Uh, so if you haven't seen this uh, construction, it, it goes as follows. So we have this discrete group, and we want to put on it an algebraic structure. Uh, so we proceed as follows. We filter this group G by some subspaces, subsets of automorphism, each of which has a natural structure of algebraic variety. So in particular, in this case, for G, you can fix number K and consider all automorphisms sigma such that, so remember that automorphism sigma is given by its images on X and Y, right? So it's given by a pair of non-commutative polynomials. So if I fix K, I can consider all sigmas such that the degree of sigma is less or equal than K, which means that degree of a sigma is just a maximum of four numbers, degrees of, degrees of images of X and Y, and degrees of images of X and Y under sigma inverse, right? So it turns out, and it's very easy to show, that such subset of automorphism for each fixed k has a natural structure of a fine variety. And we have a filtration by such a fine varieties, which makes g in algebraic variety. And uh, thus, g becomes in the algebraic group. So this, this construction goes back to Shafarevich, who applied it to Cremona group. And later, many people looked at more other algebraic examples. But here, it's very important that we apply this construction to the automorphism of free algebra. Uh, so as I said, this GNs are, cons GNs are naturally subgroups of G. So G acts algebraically on this collodial Moses spaces. It's easy to check that this end algebraic structure on G is compatible with algebraic structure on CN. And so every isotropy subgroup becomes actually end algebraic closed in the algebraic subgroup. So this, this puts on each GM uh, such an algebraic structure. Um, so in, in our paper, we try to kind of carefully study this thing, this structure. Uh, but I, I, I will only focus on something surprising. So I recall that, well, if you have a topological group, you can consider Borel subgroups. So Borel subgroup is just, um, connected solvable subgroup, which is maximal among all connected solvable subgroups. So if you look at this group G, then kind of by analogy with finite dimensional case, I mean, it has a kind of obvious candidate, uh, which is this group of triangular transformation. Uh, of course, this B, as I said, as a discrete group, you can take G to be either Cremona group or automorphism of Weyl algebra. Uh, as I said, they have different in algebraic structures, but as discrete groups, they're the same. Um, they're isomorphic. So you can ask, you can look at G, this automorphism B in each of them. And then the first theorem is exactly what you expect, what you have in finite dimensional case. So any Borel subgroup of G is actually conjugate to B. Um, so, uh, well, uh, as I said, that G is not isomorphic to uh, C2 as an end algebraic group. Still theorem one, the method of the proof holds for the classical Cremona group. And even in that case, it was not known. So even in this classical case, uh, this fact seems, seem to be, uh, seems to be new. So very, recent, so very recently, there was a chain of papers by Fulter, Paloni, and Popov, who tried to extend this fact to odd CD for D greater than three, and they discovered that theorem one fails. So this is a very specific fact for, for the two-dimensional Cremona group. But as I said, I, I want to go in direction of this. So 
replacing G by GM. So, uh, and the situation is the following. So, let's consider the set of all Borel subgroups of GM, on which, of course, GM acts by conjugation. Then, uh, we can, one can show that every Borel subgroup in GM is conjugate to a subgroup of G, and this gives a GM equivalent map from the set BN to G mod B. And GM acts on this, so I have written this, so I consider as a right action by right multiplication. And it turns out, again, these are uh, not difficult to prove, but this is a key fact that if you consider the quotient of this set of Borel subgroups by the joint action of GM, then uh, the induced map is actually embedded. So on this side, we take CN, this algebraic variety, and with G acts and restrict action to B and consider B orbits. So what this kind of observation says is that Borel subgroups of GM are classified up to conjugacy by the <coughs> sum orbits of B and CM. So the problem is that not all B orbits actually are in the image. Not B all, all, no, no, no. So Borel subgroups correspond to some orbits, but not all. And it is remarkable that you can actually sort of single out those orbits which, uh, which correspond to Borel subgroups in a geometric fashion. So this is CRM2. Um, so let me consider a natural uh, C star action, a natural which could be viewed as a maximal torus in G. So this T acts on CN, and then the following fact holds. So remember, I want to characterize exactly those B orbits which correspond to some Borel subgroup in B. And there are two types. Uh, so a B orbit corresponds to a conjugacy class of Borel subgroups in GN if one of the two, if and only if one of the two possibilities uh, conditions holds. So either T acts freely or T has a fixed point in the orbit. So these are not all orbits, but uh, uh, and then it turns out that when T acts freely, so the orbits of type A correspond precisely to a billion Borel subgroups, there are such. And orbits which have fixed point correspond to non abelian ones. Um, so we don't understand, I mean, it's a kind of strange thing that we have abelian Borel subgroups, and uh, uh, we don't know much about them, except for the fact that do really occur if n is greater than 3. So if you look at the 3 by 3 of higher matrices, but the orbits of type B, non-abelian, exist for all B. Uh, so I should say that this kind of results are based on work of, earlier work of George Wilson, which he studied the spaces CN quite uh, kind of closely. So one of the observations he made is the following. The fixed points uh, in CN under the sister action are represented by pairs, are exa represented exactly by pairs of important matrices. And such important matrices, such conjugacy classes, are actually one-to-one -one correspondence with partition of M. Uh, with some work, we can actually prove that such important matrices sit on different B orbits. So this lemma of Wilson implies that the conjugacy classes of non-abelian Borel subgroups I by injection with partition of n. So which means that there are exactly Pn finite number of conjugacy classes of non-abelian Borel subgroups uh, for, for, for any n. So for example, CRM1 fails for n greater than 1, uh, greater or equal than 1. <coughs> uh, OK, so the last kind of ingredient is the following. Uh, again, this is a classical theorem of Steinberg in, in the theory of algebraic groups, uh, uh, which turns out to, to be true in this, for this in algebraic groups. So what Steinberg asks is the following. If you have specifically a reductive, linear reductive algebraic group, I think he considered all a field of characteristic zero. So he wanted to characterize Borel subgroups. By definition, these are 
this depend on topology, he wanted to characterize them in purely group theoretic terms, abstract. And the answer is this theorem. And on a, well, so this is an analog, precise analog of the theorem in our case. So in non abelian subgroup of GM is Borel if and only if first H is maximal solvable. Notice there is no topology, no connective. And H contains no proper subgroups of finite index. So Borel subgroups are characterized by in purely abstract terms. Uh, so it doesn't hold uh, for all Borel subgroups. So you can see for n equal, already for n equals zero, um, uh, these conditions do not characterize those abelian ones. So we have no idea how to, uh, but non-abelian ones nevertheless can be characterized. And now, of course, if you put things together, you get this fact. So theorem three and four combined together imply the GN are pairwise non-isomorphic. So those invariants which distinguish them are exactly the sets of conjugacy classes of non-abelian Borel subgroup. By theorem three, the sets are finite and distinct, and by theorem four, they're independent of algebraic structure. So really, we extract n by extracting pn, the number of partitions of, of Lake. So this is, uh, uh, okay, maybe I'll close by mentioning this conjecture which, um, well, whenever you talk about real algebra, any interesting fact you mention immediately, the question is what is the relation to Dixinia conjecture? So Dixinia conjecture says that every non-zero, non-trivial endomorphism of the Weyl algebra must be automorphic. That's a classical conjecture. So in other words, if you have two differential operators, which commutate of which equals one, they define your uh, automorphism of A1. It's still not known. Um, it's, well, <laughs> so um, there is a natural, from this point of view, extension of this conjecture. Uh, philosophically, it's very uh, sort of natural because while algebra, as I said, it's not commutative algebra, so it's natural to state Dixinier conjecture, whatever it is, in kind of terms which would be categorical, which would depend on the category of morphics. Huh? So the conjecture is the following. So, so it's kind of extension from n equals 0 to n equals n. So if we take arbitrary n and n, so home from dn to dn is either empty. So home means that it's all algebra homomorphisms in the category of unit of algebra. Then it's either empty if n is not equal to m or invertible if n equals m. Of course, if I put n equals n equals zero, this is just a usual Dixinier conjecture. Now, what is this corollary says that the endomorphism monoids for n equals m, they're pairwise non-isomorphic, right? Because the corresponding group completions, the corresponding automorphism groups uh, are distinct, uh, again. Uh, but we still don't know whether this uh, conjecture is really stronger as it looks than the original Dixinier conjecture. So there is this, among these people studying Dixinier conjecture, there is a sort of principle, epsilon principle, that if you can take Dixinier conjecture and generalize it by some epsilon, epsilon has to be zero. So there is no really way. To. So then it should be equivalent, but we don't see how or wrong. Um, of course, uh, there was some work done by uh, on, on computer trying to to construct some to disprove it, but so far we were not able to construct any counter examples. <coughs> okay, thank you very much. So this uh, problem of reconstructing variety from its uh, algebra of operators, how is it related to a problem of reconstructing variety from Lie algebra of vector fields? 
for this problem set in Good question. Uh, okay, so short answer is that uh, <laughs> if you <laughs> if you consider varieties of of the type I consider, namely singular varieties, mm -hmm. then Vector fields is not a good notion. Imagine that you have a cusp, so there are very few vector fields really. Ah, okay, okay. Right. So that's the reason why the differential operators, the Reno differential operators on such singular varieties, are not generated by differential operators of order zero or one, because simply there are very few vector fields. Mm. So it's like, much larger. Okay. So so that's 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 the reason why we consider this kind of more fancy definition of differential operators, not just derivations and multiplication operators. But, uh, but you're right, I mean, uh, but, uh, right. Uh, but you're right, I mean, uh, on the other hand, if you look at this Indo algebraic group and look at the corresponding Lie algebra, then in fact, the way, how do you prove that these Indo algebraic groups are not isomorphic. The point is that you compute the corresponding Lie algebras and show they are not isomorphic. So you can guess what are the Lie algebras. For example, take polynomials in two variables, <coughs> then the corresponding Lie algebra will be take polynomials of two variables, divide by constants, and consider just Poisson bracket as a Lie bracket. This is one in three dimensional Lie algebra. Second one, Take Weyl algebra, divide by constant, and consider the Lie algebra with a commutator. Then you can show these two Lie algebras are not isomorphic. Mm -hmm. uh, and it involves the theorem, maybe what you referred to by Hase-Winkel, showing that this second Lie algebra cannot be realized as algebra of vector fields on any differentiable manifold. That's one way to prove that they are not isomorphic. But uh, I, yeah. Thank you. Any I should probably apologize. Oh, right, that's the main thing. It's not the talk in differential algebra in your sense, but uh, it's still differential algebra. <laughs> uh, I have some preprints if you would like to grab one. Oh really? Yes. Oh, really? Yes. 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 Yes.